Hello and welcome to DigFinVox, the voices of digital finance. I'm your host, Jane DiBiazio. If you like this program, like, share, do all that internet stuff. It helps us grow the audience. My guest today is Kelvin Tio, co-founder of Funding Societies, one of the earliest marketplaces for peer-to-peer -peer lending in Southeast Asia. The business has since evolved quite a bit, and I spoke with Kelvin about moving into banking, cards, and all kinds of other things in the markets that he's serving, as well as new ones on the horizon. Kelvin, welcome to Ditch Finbox. Great to have you on the program. Thanks, Jim. Great to be Delighted to be here. So I'm very interested to speak with you. You are a, uh, a regional pioneer in what used to be P2P lending. Uh, and I think your business has evolved since then. But let me start off with just that peer-to-peer -peer question and then we can talk about the way that the business has evolved. Uh, you know, you were, when you began with your co-founder uh, funding societies, um, you, you know, you cited that Lending Club in the US was, uh, was a model also in China at the time, P2P was big. Those businesses are all gone. Uh, you're still here. Uh, we, even though we learned from how the other peer-to-peer -peer lenders has evolved in, has operated in other markets, we have actually not operated as a peer-to-peer -peer lender uh, at all. Um, for clarity, I think we basically lend only to SMEs or finance SMEs, so we do not lend to peers. Neither do much of our money come from peers. In fact, uh, as the market evolved, more than half of our financing comes from institutions and um, more than half of them are also on balance sheet. So, so, so it, a, yeah, so it, it, it is fair to say though that, you know, then half the business, at least in Singapore, is coming from, you know, you're a plat it's a platform play, right? You've got investors on one hand, and then you've got either uh, SMEs that are borrowing loans or they are, um, or, or they're selling invoices, right? Yes, that's right. I think it's still fair to say that how, about half of our, of our business remains a platform business, which I think is still important. Uh, in terms of getting uh, ourselves introduced to more retail and retail investors as well as SME. So I think that is still critically important for us. But we have, while we have, we have learned um, from say Funding Circle or Lending Club so and so forth as a starting point, we've evolved the business model to adapt it to Southeast Asia's context, both in terms of having partially a platform business, but also partially institutional lending business to the SMEs, um, focusing exclusively on SMEs and not doing any consumer lending at all. I think another reason why I think Southeast Asia, the fintech lending business has evolved quite differently compared to say in the other regions is that it's really the high side benefit that the regulators have here. So I still remember in 2016, MES uh, uh, proactively regulated the space because there was a big blow up in China. So I think that uh, the regulators have, have seen um, the benefits as well as the risk of fintech lending in, in other markets and have really adapted to Southeast Asia such that now fintech lending, frankly, is a big part of the overall SME's funding, uh, funding sources. In fact, the government strongly supports it um, in the form of government resharing. So in the case of Singapore, we are fortunate to be the first fintech company to be part of the bank, to be a part of a government resharing program whereby the government shares 50 to 70% of our default losses. It's a program that's meant for banks. In the case of Malaysia, we are fortunate that uh, the government co-lends with us. So for every $4 that we lend out, the government co-lends $1 with us. So it's really different in terms of how we have how the other markets have evolved. What's the difference between your base in Singapore versus operating in Indonesia and Malaysia when it comes to that mix between the platform business and the balance sheet business? It, it, I think the mix really depends on a few factors. I think number one uh, is investor appetite because investment is still relatively new in Indonesia. Hence, a lot more education uh, is required. I think number two is really borrower uh, needs. So for the case of, uh, of, uh, of Indonesia, we do a ton of e-commerce merchant financing. So we, we finance, we give out about a, uh, give out a few thousand loans every single day. Hence, it's, really, it's not easy for you to crowdfund thousands of loans every single day. And hence, it, it kind of encourages um, balance sheet lending to be a more dominant model in case of Indonesia. And finally, it's really local regulations. So at times, local regulations may limit certain limit crowdfunding to certain types of loans, which may or may not be the biggest or smallest of the portfolio. So it's really a combination of both investor, borrower, as well as uh, local regulations that has, that has 
prompted us to evolve our, bit, to our business model to, to meet a local context. Right. Now, you're not a bank, so the balance sheet, is that coming from your, your VC backing primarily? Oh, definitely not. Oh, <laughs> Equity yeah. is the most expensive form of financing when it comes to, to giving out loans, right? So uh, because we have a five, six year track record in SME financing, we are fortunate to have onboarded our first institutional lender since 2019. And in fact, that has scaled up significantly in the last six, nine months. So an interesting trend is that in 2019, not many institutional lenders were, were interested to explore, partly because the industry is still relatively new in the region. Um, and I think post uh, start, the, at the start of this year, we suddenly had more than $100 million of that pipeline coming in, uh, uh, primarily because uh, in, uh, institutions have seen uh, how we have, ad, have managed, our, managed our credit risk portfolio during a crisis period. And that's really given a lot of confidence to institutions to start in, in, uh, investing more and more into our space. How, when, you, when you make those kinds of loans, uh, what's the, the skin in the game for, for funding societies or Madaku? What's the, the level of capital coming from you versus from a, a partner bank or other lender? So I think it, we follow kind of the industry standard in terms of capital ratios. Um, so so our lab, we currently leverage up about four to five times uh, mm -hmm. for, for every dollar of equity that we have. Um, and this is, I think, seeing how uh, some of the Chinese players have experienced um, challenges when it comes to, leverage, comes to overly high leverage ratio. This is something that we are extremely cautious uh, about. And so far, we're leveraging at a rate that is kind of similar to what you see in the industry. But yeah. also on top of that, the whole goal for us is that we may, we may have loans that we put on balance sheet, but we don't plan to have it stay on balance sheet. So we, have, we are setting up a variable capital company, VCC in Singapore, to actually securitize some of these loans uh, so that we can eventually um, bring it, move, from, move these loans from on balance sheet to off balance sheet by selling it, from, selling it as a form of asset class to institutional investors in lower cost, lower interest rates uh, uh, regions like Europe and, and, uh, and, yeah. and Japan. Yeah. Okay, so that raises two really interesting questions, Calvin. First, what was the lessons that you got from the, the ant uh, situation in China where you know, a big part of the reason for the regulators to crack down on the IPO was uh, you know, this, this issue of, of lever you know, how much capital they were putting in, how much risk they were putting in vis-a-vis -vis risk to the, the institutions and I guess to the borrowers. Um, as a result of that, you, know, you mentioned that you keep your leverage ratios uh, within what you consider reasonable bounds. But what have the conversations with the regulators or your investors been like in the wake of that? You know, is that a model that people are looking at or is that seen as a very specific case that's unique to China? Actually, I think it is a, it's, it's a specific case that is perhaps unique to China and that the lesson was actually taught not in 2021, but in 2016. Uh, that because Southeast Asia was, uh, came, late, uh, came relatively late into the into the into the fintech lending space, um, it was, we knew that it was, and we how we saw how things blew up in China. It, we were very cautious in terms of making sure that we proactively engage the regulators, probably uh, overly updating them or overly communicating in terms of hey, this is what we are doing. These are some of the risks that this model will have would, would entail. These are the things that we are we are doing to actually address uh, address uh, these risks, and we proactively update the regulators on that front. So I think that has enabled us to 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 stay very close to regulators and make sure that we are we are operating in a uh, in a fully clean model and that there's no regulatory risk in our business. Yeah, and then the second thing is I wanted to explore this securitization program that you're looking to set up. Uh, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, you've got all these loans, uh, a variety of different uh, types of of tenors and and maturities and uh, and rates. How do you package these up and how do you get, I guess, do you need a credit rating for these? And, and how do you make sure that basically there's some transparency to the end investor so we don't end up with, um, you know, a smaller version of, you know, like subprime lending in America that blew up? I think, I think that, uh, I think in terms of transparency, I think that's extremely important for us. There are really two or three things that are mission critical. I think number one is that um, this assets will need to be credit rated. Uh, we recognize that this is relatively new in the region, but we also see that this space is a fast evolving space. Um, and that, and we do, and with the interest of institutional lenders that we're currently receiving, we do think that um, securitizing and selling it will be something that is, that, that is only a matter of time. And we do expect our first tranche of loans to be securitized and sold to be in 2022. So within the next uh, six to 12 months, time, six to 18 months, six to 12 months time. Yeah, and what's the what's the investor base for those sorts of securitized loans? Um, what are the types of institutions that would be interested in this, and and 
what kind of, I guess, uh, characteristics of the products uh, are you talking about? I think that so far we expect the, the institutions to, to be interested in it. I really a um, impact funds as well as uh, as well as fund managers in mostly Europe and, and East Asia. Um, primarily because of the relatively low um, interest rate environment in these markets, as well as the, the interest to diversify the portfolio. So not just equities, but as a form of fixed income, private debt fixed income, which has turned out to be relatively, uh, which with low, un relatively uncorrelated with the pub public markets and really to build exposure in emerging markets like Southeast Asia. So I think our advantage is that, hey, we cannot just securitize loans from one country, Indonesia, but really providing investors a portfolio of exposure across the region, leveraging our presence in Singapore, Indonesia, Malaysia, as well as Thailand, and yeah. very soon Vietnam and Philippines. What is the, the licensing that you will need? Because essentially you're, not, you're, you're getting into sort of investment banking territory now uh, as you begin to securitize things. Uh, does that change the, the the profile that you will need vis-a-vis -vis your regulators? So it does require uh, the entity that will house uh, ring fence and subsequently sell these loans will need to have a variable capital company license, um, which is very much a new new uh, the, the reg as part of regulatory region of of, of Singapore. Um, but we are we are also partnering with another fund management house to be, as a as a third party to manage uh, these loan transactions. So 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 really leveraging on what uh, focusing our ability on things that we're best in, and then subsequently working with other fund management house in, in things that they are best in. Okay. Uh, so Kelvin, you had applied for a virtual banking license in Singapore. Uh, mm -hmm. You didn't get it, but many people did not get it. Very competitive. Uh, what was the business thinking behind that? And what will you do now that if you don't have the, the banking license in Singapore? So I think answering the question in a few parts, firstly, I think it was a huge uh, honor as well as experience being in a consortium together with Singapore Powers, uh, Xiaomi as well as AMTD in a consortium. And it's, it's unfortunate that uh, we didn't get it, but I think the whole experience has been extremely valuable in terms of preparing us for, for new banking business model, um, as well as engaging the regulators as we've gone through the, uh, the entire process on, uh, on an end-to-end -end basis. And, um, I think that, Moving forward, we do see the huge opportunity to really offer a new bank offering by in partnership with incumbents like markets like Singapore, even in the case of Indonesia, um, through our shareholders like BRI, uh, Bank Rakyat Indonesia. Um, we are also we have also quietly put in a bid in a, as a consortium with uh, uh, in Malaysia, and we do have significant plans that we are executing now in the case of Indonesia for digital banking. So this is something that we see as a as going to be a huge part of our business moving forward, either we owning our own license or we are leveraging on other people's license and offering a new bank proposition. Yeah. That, that would allow you to expand greatly the balance sheet type of work that you're doing. Um, is that the primary driver or are there other benefits to having a bank license? I think for us, the key goal is to really uh, bundle our current software as a service as well as uh, virtual credit and financing uh, propositions together with a bank account so that we can be the primary bank of SMEs. I think currently, uh, I think we started off as a, as the, as a focusing on SME financing and currently with the largest SME digital financing platform in Southeast Asia, primarily because SME credit is one of the biggest hook to bring customers on board. Like a company or even a, a SME will move from one bank to the other if you provide them credit. And without the loan and with the loan repayment data that we've accumulated in the last six years, I think we are best positioned to do that. And I think leveraging on that, we have built up a series of software as a service, SaaS, expense management capabilities, as well as virtual credit cards to really offer to help SMEs and to manage the transaction. The last step for us to actually own is to actually own or control the bank account so that we can integrate all these virtual credits, expense management, and bank account, to, account together to give SMEs the, a 360 view of how to run a business. I think this is mission critical because we see that a lot of digital banks overseas, everyone offers a digital bank, maybe leveraging an ecosystem. But what we see is that many digital banks end up becoming a secondary tertiary banks of companies or even individuals. And if you do not have most of the CASA or most of the transactions on that bank account, and if you're overly rel relying on cashbacks, to attract customers, what happens is that you'll see a similar Tesco situation whereby only 12% of their customers are using it as a primary bank account once the LTV is terrible and end up, um, end up fold, uh, folding at some point. I think by leveraging on credit as the first entry point, I think it's a lot more efficient from a customer acquisition perspective and frankly better in terms of overall monetization. So our goal is really, to, uh, our new goal for Neobank is really 
combine our, our, our various propositions together so that we can eventually be the primary bank for SMEs across Southeast Asia. So the way that you compete with other virtual banks, uh, uh, e-commerce platforms that are doing some of these things, you know, the Grab and Gojeks of the world, um, is to really push that, that lending piece first, as opposed to trying to get people in the door through transactions or through payments and, 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 and hit them right away with the, with the high margin stuff. That's correct. And I think that leveraging on our capabilities in financing, um, we have launched our virtual credit since early this year, actually late last year, and it has achieved significant traction uh, for SMEs. I think virtual credit is basically at the intersection of both financing as well as payments. And that also helps us to also diversify not just our products, but also revenue sources with, with payments revenue. And I think that perhaps compared to the other uh, ride sharing or e-commerce platforms of the world, um, oftentimes we see them to, to be more focused on consumers, frankly. Uh, even though the pitch may be a lot more on, on SMEs because I think that's the, that's the theme of the day. Um, but I think that our exclusive focus on SMEs, um, our financing first virtual credit card approach, as well as being a neutral player in the market so we can serve merchants open loop across all platforms rather than say, hey, I can only serve SMEs across one, one e-commerce platform or one registering platform. I think the neutrality, the financing focus, uh, virtual credit card focus, as well as SME first approach, I think what helps us to differentiate when it comes to SME digital banking. Yeah. What would be the biggest challenge? Is it regulation? Is it just the sheer number of other players that are in this space? Uh, it, getting the SMEs themselves to, to use these tools? What, you know, what's the hard part? Actually, I think all three of them are probably not the hardest part because um, getting SMEs to use this tool is not hard when you are, you are offering a credit card because there's very little education and that is a pretty wide space. Every other fintech is offering a debit card, which is just giving you a form factor for the money that you already have. Um, so, so I think a virtual credit card itself is a major differentiator and something that SMEs would know how to use anyway. So integrating with expense management is not a hard thing to do. From a regulations perspective, I think it's quite fortunate for us that uh, regulations are opening up in all the markets and incumbents are more and more willing to, to work with fintechs. Um, competition, is, we don't see it as a big issue primarily because it's a huge, huge market. Um, Southeast Asia is so very underbanked um, or even unbanked. Even in the case of Singapore, we see that a lot of SMEs are not getting much unsecured financing, um, if not because of government, and it's, they're only getting it because of the government sharing program. So to us, I think that is really how can we execute the business or, uh, and bring everything together um, in, in a timely manner. And I do think that because of the, capa the credit capabilities that we have built, it, has, it allows us to carve out a very nice niche uh, for us, uh, for SMEs that want to be treated as first-class citizens in a bank. What's the connection with payments? You've talked about credit cards a little bit there. Um, what is your, your, your cards and your overall payment strategy? How does it fit in? So I think that we have started off by offering virtual credit uh, to e-commerce merchants um, as a way for them to extend their credit terms because we see that a lot of SMEs are moving online. They do, uh, in terms of purchasing their inventories, um, or their goods, but what we, find, what we find is that a lot of, you will never, the big, big, biggest challenge of that is that, hey, you do not, you have to pay immediately um, if we buy goods online. I think that we have offered virtual credit as part of a way to, to give credit terms for SMEs that are, buying, that are buying things online. Similar, it's a bit like a buy now, pay later for SMEs in short, uh, but more in a more commercial sense. Um, I think we have partnered with some, uh, with, with some companies to actually launch a virtual credit card regionally. Uh, in the, within the next few months. So really offering from not just virtual credit to a form of a cart so that, hey, SMEs can actually use it to swipe to purchase things, not just online, but also offline. Uh, as you go just, into, yeah, yeah. So as you go into the cards business itself directly, are you, will you need to work with a, a bank or an acquirer or, are the, or is it more like the fintechs out there that are providing credit card type services or do you go just directly to like a Visa or MasterCard? We are actually picking both partnering with both fronts because in different countries the, the dynamics is a bit different. Uh, we have not made announcements yet, but basically we are partnering on both fronts in terms of both fintech, um, a direct payments company, as well as a bank to to launch our own virtual credit card offering. Okay, um, you guys have been going on for uh, twenty. No, sorry, uh, since uh, what 2015 or 2016 now? 2015. So about, okay, so six years. Uh, um, what does it take to get to the point where you can then start to go into new markets? What uh, determines the speed of entry is really local market regulations as well as frankly COVID. We don't think that entering into a new market during COVID-19 is the best of, uh, okay. of timing. 
Um, and that I think that we should enter only when the regulations, local regulations are ready. And I think that in the last three, four years or so, we have really focused on not just growing fast, not just keeping defaults low, but making sure our revenue and our margins are, are tremendous. In fact, uh, we were fortunate to, uh, compared to I think many of our peers, um, even though from our origination side, we are probably 50% bigger than the others, but from what I, from the information that we got, our revenue is about four or five times of the revenue of our peers. We have really focused on not just growing fast, but really uh, uh, growing with good economics um, so that we, will be, we are profitable in the near future. How do you scale? You've been from the start in three markets in the region. Now you're going to five to six. Um, can you actually scale in Southeast Asia or is it really market to market? I think it is really, I think a, uh, there is a, a significant part that is market to market, primarily because each of the markets are, are quite standalone, and are quite different, you really need to customize to it. But increasingly with the rise of, uh, of uh, regional uh, tech companies, B2B tech companies, with the, with the fast digitalizing of SMEs, I think that there is a real convergence in terms of how we can serve the markets across the different countries. Um, but we do see that the fundamental data of the SMEs and Asian markets remains quite different. So in the sense that I think every tech player would like to say, hey, or fintech players would like to say, hey, I have a ton of SME data. But the reality is that for you to model out um, the credit risk of the company, you need Y variable data, which is the loan repayment data. So unless you've given loans to these SMEs, the X variable data is not necessarily the most helpful in terms of actually man managing credit risk. Right, so it takes time before you can get those credit models really working effectively. Correct. And I think that for us, that, that's basically our advantage, right? This has been our bread and butter. This has been something that we're focused on. Now we're leveraging on our strength in, fin in financing and credit to really expand into virtual credit card payments and, eventually, and, and very soon new banking. You mentioned that you expect to be uh, profitable soon. How important is that? And what's the exit for you guys? I mean, are you looking at some point to IPO and how, how important will it to be in the black? Uh, because we've seen so many tech companies attempt to scale with, with by just burning cash uh, and with mixed results. I think we have taken a very conscious choice that um, we, we, want, we want to grow fast. So before COVID, we were growing about 220% CAGR year on year. And even, I think after COVID, we'll still grow more than 100% year on year. Um, so so we, we, are, we, we are focused on growing fast, but at the same time, we want to grow smart with good economics. Hence for, uh, and I think the, the idea is not about, hey, we do not, we can't afford to burn. I think that's not the idea to hear. The idea is that we want to have financial freedom to control, uh, control the speed um, of spend and speed of investments and to really be prudent in terms of how we spend the capital that we raise. Um, so, so we are not planning to compromise in terms of any of our growth, but making sure that uh, every dollar of growth is at, with good economics. And it's also partly why we've taken an approach of, hey, not just uh, acquiring a ton of customers. And, and as you would know, Many who have claimed that uh, acquiring really poor quality customers um, who has pretty high KYC risk that banks don't want to serve, therefore they're acquiring them and they can acquire it fast. For us, we want to make sure that we acquire good quality customers. And that's why you see that a lot of our customers actually stay with us for a pretty long period of time. Um, we, we have a very solid, uh, uh, solid LTV, uh, LTV over CAC ratio across all our product segments. So for us, it's, the whole idea is really to balance, have a good balance between growing fast as well as growing profitably um, so that we can control our food destiny, uh, our food destiny. And that we do believe that if we execute this well, we, can, we should be primed for IPO uh, in the next few years. Um, but we also recognize that hey, not, not everyone who wants to IPO can, can IPO. Um, if, we, if we do not deliver, uh, execute in terms of what we believe we can't, um, the next best option we believe is to be, is, is to be, uh, would be a trade sale by another tech player uh, from overseas. Great. Calvin, thank you so much for joining me on Digfin Vox uh, and good luck with all of that execution. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you.